Hi, welcome back to another uh, Terranscapes. Who am I? Terranscapes question and answer episode. Uh, just before we begin, a couple quick uh, comments. One is uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Q&As, at the end of this episode, there will be a little um, uh, email address in the corner. That is the email address if you'd like to submit a question. Uh, two, I got a comment from a viewer who thought it would be helpful, certainly to him, but I thought it might be interesting for everybody else if I listed the questions that are going to be covered and I'll put them here and then I will um, link them to the right time spot in the video. So if you're interested in some but not others, you can uh, skip. I'm not going to leave them up for the whole episode though, but um, you know, maybe I'll put them up periodically or something. I don't know. It's new to me. Um, and uh, let's see. Three is that I'm going to try something new. I have my new monitor, which I showed in my uh, studio tour, and it's big enough. I can boost up the font, and I can read it from here. So if you see me looking over, that's what I'm doing, and uh, I'm going to manipulate it with my mouse on my knee. Modern tech, huh? You know? Lasers. Um, so uh, the real drinking game for all of you out there is uh, by which question uh, that I will drop this on the floor and break it. All right, so take your bets. All right, uh, with all that said, let's jump in. Jason writes, my question is in response to constant wife gripes about the waste management of my terrain building. I know you're in a basement setup, although I've only seen the one wall that I can remember. Previous video, two back, I'll show the studio. Uh, my question is, how do you deal with dust, the smell and smoke of hot wire going through foam, painting, things like that. All right, uh, let's see here. First, smells and solvents, they all go under the hood and the hood is just enough negative pressure to keep it from coming out into the room. Um, it's only a four cubic feet per minute duct fan, so it's not a big fan. And it's the kind of fan that if you really wanted to or you felt you needed to or your wife thinks you need to, you could install that in a basement window maybe, put in a, a fake pane of glass, uh, you know, make a wood cutout, stick a four inch duct fan in that, and that might also uh, you know, be enough to vent out some of the gases in the basement or wherever you work. Uh, if I'm doing um, sort of fuming types activities away from the hood, like extensive amounts of uh, hot wire cutting, uh, where I might need a big area, uh, then that just stinks up the room. Uh, and it can get kind of bad if you're doing like five hours straight of cutting uh, and uh, the missus will notice when she comes down the stairs. But I'll run the duct fan in the hood anyway just to pull a little of that out and sometimes I run a little tiny fan uh, that I've had since college. And uh, it, 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 doesn't, it looks like it's from college now. Uh, but anyway, just to move a little bit of the air around the basement um, to try to even that out and to blow some of those fumes over to the hood. For dust management, I do, um, for dust collection at the moment, I actually have been using a uh, box fan and I take a furnace filter and I put it on the back of the fan so that when you turn it on, it's pulling air through the uh, filter, not pushing air into the filter. If you had it on the front, right? You know, I say put it on the back. And then um, if I'm doing um, fine, small amount of work right next to it, it collects dust really, really well. So like if I'm gonna do a lot of balsa foam work for the uh, unplugged building, I can, you know, sand it and do stuff and I have that fan running right here and it just keeps that, if there's any dust that gets in the air, it drifts that direction. For extreme amounts of dust production, I now use two of those. I make a corner with them and then I have um, some cardboard that I use to make a, basically a, um, what do you call it? It's like a, not a tent, but um, I guess it's a modified hood in essence. And um, with that set up, I can produce a lot of dust and collect almost all of it really, really well. You do need to vacuum off the furnace filters regularly, however. And uh, for me, depending on what I'm doing, it might mean I have to vacuum it off a couple times in a session if I'm doing a lot of nasty work. Um, the other dust management uh, that I do is I vacuum. Hi, Sadie. Yeah? It's apparently, she wants to come in and answer a question. Um, it's one of our cats. My, it's our cat now. <sighs> Damn guy. Um, dust collection. Vacuuming. 
city. Stop. 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 She's very spoiled when she comes in. She really feels like everybody's attention should go to hers. Um, I vacuum regularly. I vacuum the entire studio at least once a week, sometimes twice. I vacuum the, this sort of sitting area here where you saw on the, the tour, my laptop, and of course by the workbench, and that, this area, that gets it almost maybe three times a week or more uh, because so much stuff just collects right there because this is the focus of all of the traffic. Um, and uh, then every six or eight weeks, I do a pretty deep vacuuming where I actually go through and I vacuum some shelves and um, I pull things out and try to get in the corners. So I'm trying to be pretty fastidious about it um, because it does make a lot of dust and uh, it's gross and I need a clean environment. You know, you, you see the environment, let's put clean in air quotes, um, but I, I need it to be tidy and orderly uh, to be able to focus. Uh, so hopefully that helps you. Um, you know, if you need to make a, a box fan a furnace filter to keep your wife happy, uh, that is a pretty good deal because you can get a box fan for about, why am I not, here we go. Hey, hey, a little bit of a technical glitch there. Um, I thought I had a problem with my mouse. I don't know. I didn't drop it though. All right, let's move on. Oh, uh, I think I got trailed off. Um, if getting a uh, dust filter and a box fan makes a big difference to your wife. Uh, 12 bucks for the box fan, three bucks for the filter. Not a bad way to go. CH writes, can I use Combat Hex miniature Lord of the Rings figures with my Games Workshop Lord of the Rings uh, strategy battle game miniatures? I haven't seen any hex pieces to compare the scale, thanks. Um, I actually did some looking on this a little while back, actually, and it occurred to me that I'd seen some Lord of the Ring figures out and about in the web that I didn't recognize, and they're from the Hex game. Um, and uh, no, I do not think you can use them together. I believe the Hex game is a larger scale. Uh, so, you know, what I would do is um, actually a very good place to go maybe would be Board Game Geek. Um, oftentimes they have a lot of detail on the components of games and they might have the scale there. I just Google scale, hex game, Lord of the Ring miniatures. I'm sure somebody out there has it. But um, I think um, the strategy battle game are 20 millimeter, I think. Um, and I think the hex game is a little bit larger than that. So um, I would search it out, but I, my, I'm pretty confident, no, you cannot use them together. Um, no. Um, unless you, maybe, maybe an ogre, you know, if it's bigger in scale, it's just bigger. I don't know. Milo's writes, I was wondering whether you plan on doing tutorial videos in the future. I remember seeing in some video slash videos that you said when I start making tutorials and that got me very excited uh, because I'm really interested in knowing your secrets. So will there ever be any tutorial videos and is this something we can all look forward to? Well, Milos, yes, there we go. All right, moving on. No. Um, I had s planned on starting them uh, last month, and I don't know what happened last month, and it was the one of the goals of my Patreon sort of, um, uh, you know, campaign was to, you know, when I get this certain level of support, I could free up more time to work on tutorials, and I feel like I haven't been true to that. But also Patreon's a little weird because the number isn't really the number because every video after that drops in value by a lot actually, you know. So it's not like when I set it up, I was like, oh, that it would be this kind of an income and it's not really matching that. But I am a man of my word and I am planning on doing some. Now, the, the hard part has been trying to fit it in because the ocean boards, I've been really worried about them and then I'm trying to keep up with my YouTube content and you know give you some mini reviews and q and a's and things like that so it has been a bit of a juggle but i've actually been really really close i even brought down some materials to make a uh, a little table i thought i'd make a little table here to work on so i can keep some of this arrangement the same um and so that actually was just about to happen so i'm gonna give a firm word that I will have some done by the end of this month. 
Um, and as I've mentioned, I think in the past, they will be going up on Vimeo. I don't want to put them up on YouTube. I'm really annoyed by Google and YouTube. I stick with them because you're all here, but uh, I don't need to give them anything else. Um, and so um, once they are up and I've produced a small handful, four maybe, so I feel like there's like actual content for somebody to look at, I will come back and let you know about it at that time. So I might take a day off this week and just try to just sit down and just do one or two and see how it goes because I feel like there's going to be some hiccups. I have a good sense of what it's going to look like and how it's going to work and what, they, what they're going to be. Uh, but it's just a matter of getting down to it. So thank you, Milos, I believe it was Milos, for reminding me and uh, encouraging me to get on top of that. You will hear about this more soon, I promise. Uh, Michael writes, um, oh, yeah, okay. He sent the um, Q&A to the wrong email address. He sent it to my mic at terrenscapes.com. And then he's apologizing. No apology is needed. I, I don't get half things in my world right. Um, but just as a reminder that um, it goes to the, uh, the email that you'll see down here, the Q&A email, which is, I believe, terrenscapes at gmail. And, um, and uh, if you send it to my regular email, I'm just going to send you a quick note that says, please send it to there because then I keep them all together and I don't lose anything. Um, but uh, no apologies needed. That's a nice guy. Um, you speak a lot about blending and feathering surfaces to create natural looking pieces, but you also speak of using contrast to make pieces pop on the table. I understand that this all applies uh, to manifold circumstances and most likely comes down to the artist's eye, but do you have any personal guides, mantras, adages, rules, etc., etc., that you use to assist you in finding some balance between visually natural looking areas and tabletops that do not mix into a blur? That's a good question, and it's a, not an easy one to answer. It's a, it's a great question, and it's one that I actually struggle with. And um, I've tried to answer this question already, and I actually exceeded my camera's recording time, which means I've been gabbing too much. So I'm gonna try and distill it down, which is very hard for me, which is actually, this entire question is kind of hard for me. I look at the blur contrast pop is not really quite in that discrete way. I look at it in th maybe three main ways. One, if I'm gonna have a broad area that is gonna be the foundation, the big cliffs, hills, the, the surface of the table, whatever, I want, you know, you're gonna have your dominant color, then I want two colors that are a shade off, for instance, a darker green, and then maybe a light tan green uh, to go with the flock, for instance, if it's medium green. Same with the rocks, right? If it's gray, I have a little gray brown, a little gray red, and I'm trying to tie that in. And this is not really about highlighting. This is more about the base colors that accompany it. If I'm gonna do a chunk of, of uh, vegetation, a row of hedges, something like that, then I want to have five colors plus because nature has a lot of colors in the you know leaves of the world, and I want to um, have you know maybe three textures if I can, uh, maybe more because it really helps to separate those individual plants and makes it look more interesting. And then once I've got my foundation, my my clumps done. Then I go in and do the sort of contrast, you know, sort of poppy things where I'm, I, I know I say that word and it sounds corny right now, but you know, a little clumps of flower, a dead fallen limb, um, something like that, that gives that section a visual element that's interesting to make people come in, take a look at it, and helps to lift that element out off the table. Now, saying all of that, I am still learning and I am not getting it right, I think, I th meaning I can improve. I can improve. And I was looking at Scenic Express, their website. If you haven't been to Scenic Express, you should check it out. And they have these mats that you can just like roll out, peel off the stick, put it down for your railroad. One of them had this, this uh, assortment of, it was like um, supposed to be like a forest litter. You know, you put trees on top of it, something like that. And it had fallen limbs, wood shavings, and uh, different clumps of, oh boy. All right, there's some water running. Hopefully you keep, I'm going to roll with it. Um, 
and then uh, you know clumps of different textures of a flock and some other things but it wasn't like here's a clump here's a clump it was a little inter stitching of all of these things in a way that was still random but more evenly distributed and I've been moving that direction Uh, boards that I did I, I, I actually started to think about that much more co concretely spread out that stuff don't make them an island an island pops that's for sure but it can make the other areas look very bland so the rest of it will blur right and then you have just the island jumping out so by island right you follow what I'm saying here right a clump of things on the table it doesn't matter what they are so Take with that what you will and count that as an answer. I hope that addressed it in some way. This is my third attempt to answer that question. And it's, it's hard for me to answer it because I feel like I don't know it well enough myself in some ways. Don't over pop. Make sure you have variety. Highlight softly. How's that? Boy, I could have saved myself a lot of time. The computer's doing weird stuff. Um, recently, oh, who is this? This is, uh, Dr. Q Wolf, I'm going to say. I'm recently getting back into D&D, &D, and as Dungeon Master, you always look for ways to suck your players into the world you've created. Have you ever made any modular dungeon tiles, something that is indoors, underground themed, and can be mixed and matched to make different layouts, is uh, what I'm talking about. I've seen some videos on YouTube of sets people have made, but none that I've seen even begin to approach your level of quality. Well, that's, that's very nice of you. I appreciate that. Um, do you think you would ever make any of these sets? And finally, do you think that transportation and storage or something like this would cause too much damage to the tiles to make it worth it? Um, let's see. The very, the very short. I'm not even going to start like that. Why would I say that? It's not going to be the very short. A couple things come to mind though. One, building dungeon tiles out of Hearst Art molds is a common way to do it. You should check out the Terrain Tutors channel. Um, he is working on a set himself right now. Uh, positives about that is it's relatively straightforward to get everything square and to have nice textures on it. The uh, downside is that um, they are heavy when they're done and they're fragile because it's plaster and it's a long time to cast. So it's not typical that people will build it, especially for transport, you know, more if you're hosting, I would think. Um, and um, if you haven't seen the dungeons that the tile, that the molds make, you should go to herstarts.com and take a look at his dungeons that he set up using them. Pretty, pretty cool, actually. I was pretty impressed with it. But let's set that aside for a second. I would recommend as an alternative to take a look at um, the DMG Info's channel. Um, and uh, I'll put a link here just in case I, I don't get the name exactly right. Um, and he does dungeon terrain with the mantra of keeping it low cost, quick to build, and looking nice. I went and I watched his very first video. I think by accident, I was kind of combing through his stuff and I, I was like, oh, and I, it ended up being the first episode. I'm not sure how I ended up on it, but it's a great episode to watch because he gives a really nice description of his philosophy about dungeon terrain, which may not be your philosophy, but it's a philosophy that's worthy of consideration and it, it helps to uh, define what his channel is all about. Um, he uses a lot of very basic materials, cardstock, markers, aluminum foil, and produces great looking terrain that's relatively quick to build. And that's another consideration for dungeon work is if you need a lot and you want to change it over time, you know, spending 40 hours on a single room is not going to get your dungeon built very quickly. So, uh, 
have I ever done that work? No. If somebody were to um, contract for it, I would do it. I think it's going to be pretty time consuming. I'd have to think about how I could do it faster. I would think making some molds of large sections so I could build up walls and things like that would be important. Hmm. Um, so if you go to the DMG info and what you're really thinking about, ask him. I can't believe that he doesn't know other channels that are doing um, dungeon terrain and uh, he might be able to point you in a different direction. And if you do get pointed in a different direction, let me know because I would love to see what else is out there and then I can pass it on to other viewers. All right. Um, wait. And the last question. Thank goodness. Not because of you guys asking questions, but because I... See, it's a curse. I'm not supposed to have the mouse over here like this, but the computer's doing something weird. I'm rendering a video. Not a good idea to do anything with the computer when I'm rendering. There's water going on upstairs. I'm... All right. Here we go. We're going to wrap it up with Frank's question. Frank asks, I was wondering if two-part foam could be used to make foam sheets to use in terrain making. As in, pour the mixed liquid foam into a two foot by two foot by three inch mold made of plastic and let it set. Unmold it, you'd have a rigid foam board. Thoughts on that? Is it possible? Yes. I've given it strong consideration myself, actually. In the past, I even did a mock-up mold of a 10 inch by 20 inch board. Nothing fancy, just to pour it and just to uh, get it out of there and see what it looked like. I think it's a moderately advanced casting situation there because you're really going to need to maintain very firm dimensions on it, right? It, you can't have the, the mold bow when it's curing. And as the foam expands, it ex exerts a lot of pressure. You can build a shell to hold it, but you got to have the shell strapped down really nicely. Or, you know, with a flat board, you maybe don't have to have it. You could have a single piece shell, but you also have to apply back pressure to it. Then when you demold it, is it going to be really strong? I found that the corners were not as strong as I had hoped for, which was one of my main goals back then of trying to mold my own boards. So can it be done? Yes. I think it's going to be a little tricky. I would try to make, say, a few, uh, let's say, it's weird, because as it gets bigger, it gets more challenging just based on its size alone. But I might try to make, um, say, like six uh, squares this big, cast them up, tile them out, see. How about, how, how do they sit height-wise? Because when the foam expands, and you have to put that back pressure, if you don't have enough, uh, if you have too much foam, right, it'll lift that board, even with 400 pounds on it, it'll lift it. And so you're going to have a weird, you know, depth for the tiles. Um, if I were to suggest a two-part foam for it, I would probably recommend a very high-density foam. Uh, the two-part foams are sold by the finished weight per cubic foot after it expands. So currently, um, I have a uh, bottle of foam at five, which means for a cubic foot, once it sets, it's going to weigh five pounds. They go up from there, they have um, a foam at 13, so that's gonna be twice as dense, almost three times as dense, and the denser the foam, the stronger it's gonna be, but it also expands a lot less. So it gets much more expensive because instead of adding in a cup and getting three cups out of it, you have to add a cup and two thirds to get three cups out of it or two cups to get three, right? So it starts getting a lot more material intensive as you move up in the densities. So I don't think it's an easy task, but I don't think that should discourage you from trying it. Um, but you might get a trial size of, of expanding foam, make a mold box, make your mold, cast it up, try a couple. Think higher density foams and think about how to manage the thickness of it. Very careful measurements. All right, final thought. Very careful measurements of your resin, uh, well, it is a resin in essence, your urethane foam. 
will give you uniformed, you know, filling results. But that means you have to be doing the same thing every time, meaning an empty board, right? It's just a square. But if you have a board with, say, a valley cut in it, right? It has less volume. Now you have to roll back a little bit on the uh, amount of two-part foam you put in. Because if you put in too little, you'll have voids. If you have too much, it'll overexpand. And so knowing that right amount is part of the trick of getting those to come out consistently. Um, so otherwise you're gonna be doing a lot of sanding and it's not easy to sand 24 inches by 24 inches and get it flat because uh, I, I don't have a four foot by four foot sander. I can just drop the whole block on and make sure it's level, you know? So it's, it's a little trick to manage it at that size. Um, and two by two is big. There's my thoughts on it. So hopefully when I sit down to edit this and cobble together the crazy assortment of things I had happen and cut out and stitch together stuff, hopefully this video all made some sense and you found something useful from it. I hope so. Um, and of course, um, here you can um, use the uh, email address um, terrenscapes at gmail.com to send questions and answers uh, to the queue. And I uh, wait for four or five to get there before I shoot the next episode. And um, also don't forget, I mentioned it one more time, all the Q and A's have the uh, links to the questions in the episode in their description. So if you're not sure whether something's been covered in a previous Q&A, go back through them real quick. There's a playlist in the channel and you can just look at the descriptions real quick and see if there's one there that matches your question. If not, send me one. Okay, well, I'm gonna wrap it up here because this is gonna be weird to edit. It's gonna be weird, I just know it is. Um, but uh, thank you for joining me and um, hopefully you'll return uh, back to the channel because you know I will be back soon with another Terranscapes video. Wing rocks, right? You want multiple... Cat. You know, it almost makes me feel like it's a bad omen. I'm sure she's fine. That's just, it's kind of weird there. If you don't know what, what I'm talking about, it's fine. Um, same for rocks, right? When you're painting. This was just working a second ago. Please don't make me start and stop this all over again. What is, uh, Sadie, Jesus, man, you make it really hard. Uh, anyway, um, oh, I'm, what? Okay, this is really not working. What happened? Why is this doing this? All right, I'm gonna re-record it anyway. So why not? Because I can't. Okay, okay, okay. I have enough trouble. I don't need computer problems on top of it. I've gotta be faster, more succinct, Mike. Oh my God, what is All right, I'm gonna try and be a little, a little more succinct here. God. This is a cursed video, cursed. I don't know what the hell happened there. Jesus Christ.